My name is Jonah Jonathan, and welcome once again to the Jazz Musician's Voice. Today I've had the wonderful opportunity to interview jazz bassist Yoris Tipe. He's actually uh, an amazing um, left-handed upright bassist, which is very rare. And uh, Yoris came to the United States uh, and uh, to New York, and he's a mainstay on the New York scene, as well as in the Netherlands, where he was born. And he runs the Groningen Conservatory. Uh, in Europe, and uh, he's a really working player. He, he's uh, one of the top bassists. You might not hear his name uh, as much as some other cats, but he's on many recordings and really someone to check out. And uh, we we also uh, talked about his new uh, record that just came out in the spirit of Rashid Ali, and I highly recommend you check that out. It's actually a, a record and a book, so uh, thanks for watching this interview please uh, stay tuned subscribe share these videos with other of your jazz friends and people interested in jazz and stay tuned for future videos thank you all right so ladies and gentlemen today i have the wonderful opportunity to interview jazz bassist yoris tepe we are here in uh, washington connecticut where yoris is the bass teacher on the faculty of the litchfield jazz camp so, uh, Joris, you're a dual citizen of the USA and the Netherlands. Um, I understand you were born there? Yeah, I was born in the Netherlands, and uh, I moved to New York, you know, to, to figure out why there's so much great jazz in New York. And uh, when I arrived here, I was like, man, I gotta stay. So I never left, uh, I never left, actually. I stayed here. Um, uh -huh almost 26 years and um, after a while I got my green card and I became a citizen so that's how it went so now I'm both American and Dutch but I'm more Dutch actually but I've been I've yep. been living here for <laughs> so long that it feels home to me in New York as well that's great you know yeah. um, as a young musician um, in Holland uh, what was the music like for you getting started? Um, what did you start out on and well, how did I mean, you get into jazz? I didn't really know about jazz until I was 17, 18, 19, around that age. And when I picked up the bass and I started playing and then uh, electric bass first. That's why I play left-handed. Because I started uh, on a, on a left-handed electric bass and I switched to acoustic. And um, then I got to, you know, I, I felt like really by when I heard jazz I was like man this is amazing so I, w I really wanted to do it I, w I grew up with classical music around me but I wasn't really interested in that I liked more sports and hang out with my friends but when I got into jazz or funky music jazz music then I was like wow there's anything with groove and swing that really got me so yeah well you know um we're glad you got into the music. <laughs> uh, and uh, you went to uh, Amsterdam Conservatory right. in the Netherlands. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was nearby. Um, at that time it was Hilversum, which is a little town next to Amsterdam. And it's part of the Amsterdam Conservatory. Um, and it was pretty nice. There was a lot of uh, great players teaching there. And uh, we had some people come by and do uh, uh, master classes like uh, Red Mitchell and Ed Thickton and some people came over there and, and uh, but a lot of people came to play at the BIM house in Amsterdam which is the main club there and uh, every time I saw people from New York I was like holy moly <laughs> like yeah. that's the place that seems to be the place to go so as soon as I graduated I packed up and left to New York so when you uh, came to New York, um, I think I read in an article that you uh, you were s seeking the, the teachings of Ron Carter. I um, did, yeah. And w how was that? Did you get a chance to study with him? Yeah, I did. Uh, when, I, when I arrived in New York, I didn't know anybody except one person, which was Slide Hampton, <laughs> great trombone uh -huh. player, of course. So, And I called him up and said, man, I'm here. And so he said, oh, I'll hook you up. And he hooked me up with Ron Carter to study with him. And I did that for about six months or so. 
and then I um, uh, after that I didn't really want to study more with because I had already six years of school and then ROM and so I just went to the clubs and, and studied myself by observing people and, and hang out and, uh, and get a lot of playing experience that was more my education from that moment on Wow, so what would be uh, some of the clubs that you frequented when you first came? You, you arrived yeah, in the early there, 90s. Yeah, there's some clubs that are not there anymore, like uh, Augie's, which is now Smoke, yeah. and, and also um, Bradley's, that's no longer there. But that was the hang back then, it was really fun, and, and, and met a lot of people there, and um, made a lot of connections, and I got a lot of work, actually. In, from the beginning on, I started working. I guess uh, they liked people. They, they, people liked me because uh, they couldn't pronounce my name. Like so, it stands out. And also, yeah. I'm left-handed, so that's that's you know they remember you that way. So that's um, how I got maybe in people's minds that they called me for gigs. Also, um, I did a lot of uh, you know New York is very welcoming That's at least at that time I don't know how it is now but a lot of bass players uh, called me to sub for them so I got a lot of work through bass players you know. that's great and later on I called them for sub for me <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so uh, going back to to Ron for a minute um, could you tell us a little bit about what you guys worked on if you can remember it or I do remember that um, we we had a kind of a rocky relationship though it wasn't uh like personally we didn't you know get along so well so musically i mean i i had a lot of respect for him and a lot of uh i, I was just great and and thankful to meet him and be around him and yeah. observe like how he was and how he approached the uh, thinking about music and stuff but um as a student and teacher it didn't work so well so I moved on pretty quickly pretty later quick, on. yeah yeah well uh, I you know I had a, a kind of similar experience with Ron I just think something about Ron you know that he's a no-nonsense just Ron you know <laughs> so yeah um, but, uh, you but but you know actually uh, I learned a lot from being around uh, like players from that generation and playing with them like later on I've been working with um, like Benny Golson and, and uh, of course Rashid Ali mm -hmm. but um, the Sonny Fortune uh, like like people like uh, um, all people that I really learned from a lot like Harold Mayburn uh, James Williams like those people um, they were really into showing you, like just just accepting you as a bass player in their group, and just play with them, and that that was like better than going to school, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, observing how they lead the band and how they think about the music, how they uh, you know deal with the audience and deal with everything, with the business, with everything. So that was a big lesson for me, even more. A lesson than an actual a bass lesson where you, you know, yeah, work yeah. on the instrument. Yeah. So what would be some memories? You know, you you worked with some of these guys. You know, the, some of the guys you mentioned. Yeah. What would be some notable uh, anecdotes for people oh, who want to okay. learn about these guys? Well, uh, there was one uh, situation. We we were in. Uh, I was with Benny Golson in Korea. And we played at this big festival, and we were, we were we were the last band, like sort of the main act of the the festival. And it was outdoors in a in the summer, um, and it was really hot. And the lamps we, we we it started to get dark, so the lamps were on the stage, and and all these inse insects came to the stage too. <laughs> so, <laughs> and this is like. Korea in the in the main in inland like not in the coast so like like you know, palm trees and kind of different situation that and, and kind of all kinds of insects that I never seen before so I'm standing right behind him and the piano players there drummer and then 
this like this big uh, insect like going on and, and sitting on his shoulder <laughs> while he's doing <laughs> the, uh, he's doing the introduction on uh, I remember Clifford. Wow. <laughs> so, and then I'm like, wow, that looks really scary, you know. So, and then the the, the insect this big like walks over to his uh, neck. So I'm like, man, you know, what if it, what's going to happen? It was like t television also, so I couldn't really do it. I didn't know what to do, so I, I took my <laughs> bow. <laughs> and I was like, man, before it hits him, I got to do something. So, uh, but so I was in doubt, like, should I just, you know, say, I, ca I can't say anything. There's like all these people and TV. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey. <laughs> so, so just as I wanted to pick up the bow and, and hit him because it was getting over here at his, in his neck and then at the end of uh, I remember Clifford he turns around and cues us to so he, uh, just at that moment he turns around and the insect moved away so, like, oh. <laughs> so later I told him like man you know you, I almost hit you with my bow <laughs> and oh. he said oh you should have done it because you know who knows maybe I w you know it could be a deadly thing or really <laughs> deadly so bug really d yeah so I mean of course that's not really a musical experience but it's like a fun story to tell definitely about, uh, <laughs> so maybe. you know when uh, you know you mentioned that you are you were a left handed upright right. bassist yeah. um, was that a challenge for you figuring it out compared to Play most of the right-handed players and uh, not as far as learning because um, when I look in the mirror, it just looks normal. Yeah, it looks, looks like normal right to you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, the the challenge was though that when I and it still is like when I arrive in a club and I really like to play and there's no bass and I can't play on anybody else's bass but my own. So that's a drag you know yeah and, or, or if I play somewhere and some other bass player comes and he wants to sit and he can't play my bass so now that I fly around the world so much it's a drag because I I always have to bring my own bass you have to bring your bass <laughs> as opposed to so many cats who can just rent something and right and yeah. the, how how frequent is it that there's left-handed uh, basis. I mean, there must be something different you have to do on the setup, like when you bring it to a luthier too, right? Yeah, you have to like inside. You have to also switch the sound post and the bass bar, so so and then glue it back together. Wow. So it's not easy to make it, but, but I mean, for one night you can switch the strings. I've done that too sometimes, but nowadays um, I have a, a like a folding bass that I bring with me, and. And it's a little bit of drag to bring it around, but since it's, it's a folding base, it's easier to fly with. And um, and I always had the advantage that I have my own base with me, so it's, uh, I know what kind of sound I have and uh, the way it's set up is like how I like it, how I like it. So. Well, that's good. You know, yeah. um, another question I was going to ask you. Uh, you know, you worked with Rashid Ali for nine years in his band. Yeah. Um, that must have been. Amazing experience. Oh man, that was that was. He was just also a great, very warm person, you know, and um, and he was like a father to me almost like that. So he be we became good friends, and and he always said like if Coltrane uh, was still alive, he would be his drummer. Well, and I I know that if he was still if Rashid was still alive I would be his bass player because we had uh, such a deep connection that's great like bass and drums and he called his uh, style of playing like multi-directional so it wasn't it wasn't free it wasn't bebop or it was like you know all kinds of I mean this this yeah. unique style of how he played and um, and I, I don't know somehow I really understood what he wanted to do, and he understood where I wanted to go. We had so much fun together, playing together. So, so you really had that. Uh, yeah. It's ten connection. years ago, but I, st I still miss him a lot. A yeah, lot. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, you've recorded uh, I many counts over what sixteen, seventeen CDs yeah. as a leader. Right. Um, 
what's the method, your method behind um, recording as a leader, and um, and you also have a lot of original tunes that you've right. done on your records. So, uh, well, um, well, th I think the um, I have the the urge to do that. Like I really need to. Um, I feel like I have a need for my music not only on the bass but also my compositions to get it out and and like yeah I, that's the, my motivation to do it and then i did it on a lot of different labels or whatever whoever i met and what situation i was to make another one then i i got the opportunity to do it so I, it varies from like s very small groups like trios to like my own big band and, and and in everything in between and um, so some periods of, of my career I was really into writing a lot sometimes I just was wanted to play with certain people and um, and you know just just got more maybe the, f the, pr the bass playing was more featured on the record than the writing um, but I always like to uh, uh, well, I kind of need not only like I, I kind of feel the need to uh, put it out and put it on there, out there. So, oh, well, it's really excellent. Cool. And uh, you know, um, running a big band is no easy task. And as a bass player, <laughs> you're working with a lot of different big bands. That must be a, a great experience. Well, I I didn't like so much to play uh, in regular big bands after so many years. So. I decided to uh, write my own stuff. Basically, that was the reason why. <laughs> yeah. And um, and I'm the way I, I conduct the band is like I stand in front of the band with the bass, um, and then of course I need my both my hands to play. So I give cues with my head to the lead alto player who then s puts up a sign. Like we all worked it out like that. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Mark Gross was usually playing lead alto. In yeah, that, in that band, like I've I haven't done anything for a while, but I'm I'm interested in going, getting back to it. Cool. Yeah. So, um, as an international uh, bassist, you know you work extensively around the globe, uh, but you know most especially in Europe and the USA. So, what would you say would be some major differences between the two places, like pros and cons between okay. the two? Yeah, that's a question a lot of people ask me. Because I, I kind of have, I have residences in both places. I have passports, two passports, and yeah, and uh, friends and and people around in my life in both areas. In both places, and, and I play gigs and teach in both places. Um, well, uh, I think the um, you know as far as for the music and uh, especially jazz music. There's no place like New York, so I just can I can never imagine like leaving New York permanently. So I gotta put keep my feet in there somehow, because there's so many people that I want to play with that are thinking alike me, and it feels so comfortable. Like you know, you don't have to explain anything to like a New York musician to what I mean, like how I want the music, wh which way I want the music to go, because we all feel, you know, I feel like I, I match with with, uh, with the people around me. And and it's important in your life to surround yourself with people that, that you feel challenged with and feel comfortable with. So as far as a musical career and the music, it's just like New York is just where I, where I need to be. You know? Yeah. And, but as far as, um, everything else almost <laughs> like uh, as far as like culture food um, like ha having a comfortable life it's nice to be in Europe it's it's actually you know better also political situation like the racism and the, mm -hmm. the difference between poor and rich and it's 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 all better in, in Europe um, so Therefore, uh, spending a lot of time there is nice. Um, and as far as playing, uh, you know, it really doesn't matter so much to me. Like where where I play, as long as 
um, I'm in a situation where where it's a nice stage and nice people who come to the concerts. That happens in the U.S. and uh, as well as in Europe, um, as well as Asia. I spend a lot of time in Asia too. Um, and uh, so, uh, and then the other thing is um, the students. If I if I teach, I teach in Europe, I teach in the U.S. and and do master classes everywhere. And uh, you know, you meet good people everywhere. And uh, there's always, um, but maybe in general, uh, the Americans um, kind of get it faster because it's their music. <coughs> Even though a lot of American people don't acknowledge jazz so much, and they are really not so. You know, they they get they they need me as a European to teach them about it. And then they're oh, but this is our music. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of weird how that goes, you know. Yeah. But uh, I don't even speak the English so well, but I can play jazz, and I, so that's sometimes I say like, okay, you, you teach me English, I teach you jazz. Like we make a deal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> with the students. <laughs> but um, I f I feel like um, maybe because it's Amer an American art form originally that. It, it gets a little easier, and, uh, and the, the level of the students is is pretty high in America. And in Europe, there's or in other parts of the world, there's also high level students, but there are less there's less of them. They're more it's more exceptional. Mm -hmm. So, but as far as playing wise for myself, I I love to play. Uh, I mean the the way the, I kind of grew up and matured in my music being in New York, so so that's that where I feel myself, my roots and my connection. Even yeah. though I'm European, but I'm a, New York, I'm a European New Yorker. Yeah. <laughs> European New Yorker. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, talking about you as a highly respected jazz educator, um, you're like one of the founders and the head of the Groningen School in, right. in Holland, um, which is a unique program, and uh, you, you also teach in the United States and in various uh, jazz camps. We're here today at the Litchfield Jazz Camp where you're yeah. teaching. Um, so tell us a little bit about your methods of teaching and how you got into Groningen and what are some yeah. pros and cons. Yeah, I'm doing, uh, after this week here in, in Connecticut, uh, I'm doing a, a week of uh, jazz camp in Shanghai, China also. Well, and, uh, and so that those are my two camps this summer, but um, I've been doing camps in Italy and and also in um, Slovenia and um, you know various places. Yeah. Yeah. But as far as um, my way of teaching or maybe the methods of teaching, I I really try to um, uh, to place myself in the shoes of the student and and I, you know a lot of times. Teaching um, is more as uh, is more like motivational, like try to get them in the right direction and make students realize that they are their own teachers. Like I'm not their teach, I'm their teacher, but I'm just helping them out to to show them where to go and push them in the right direction. Yeah. Sort of like w or like I'm saying like, hey man, why don't you try this or why don't you try that? And that. Um, helps them but if they are not uh, their own teacher and like spend time and make a schedule of, of practicing and, and checking out stuff and being cu having a curious attitude uh, that that's what they need and then you know it doesn't matter where wherever you live or wherever it, especially now with the internet there's so much information is available that but this that's also the uh, the the difficult part of it because there's so much available that you don't know where to go to find it. So I see myself as in that role more as a teacher, and I, so I give them, um, I always give them uh, uh, like information about maybe, for example, like what kind of tunes they should uh, practice or like how to use like uh, different harmonies on the tune or you know this different different things that 
I can help them to, to go to the next step and the next level and how to, co how to play together. And there's all a lot of stuff to talk about. Now, as far as groaning in the other part of your question, yeah. um, I just uh, got this idea, like, since New York was so important for my own development, like, why don't I bring a lot of New Yorkers to Europe? And I got this opportunity when when I got the position as a director of the program. The, the university was already there. It was already a program, but it wasn't mm -hmm. really jazz. It was kind of jazz and pop. And I decided to, uh, uh, or I proposed them to uh, change it into really a jazz program focused on New York musicians. And, and so I'm bringing already for 18 years now, I'm bringing every week somebody from New York uh, uh, to Europe to teach there for a whole week, Monday to Friday. And then on Saturday, this person goes back to New York and on Sunday the next one arrives and starts again on Monday, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> teaching the whole week. And that, so it's, that's all year long, except for the summer break. Um, so, and the, the teachers are all like, you know, best guys in that I can find in New York so that's nice it works out nice and it's probably the only program in Europe that works like that or maybe around the world maybe the only program that does it af every week 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 by week um, and I'm I'm one of those New Yorkers I teach my my own weeks too when I'm there <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah it's interesting so but we have um, ex ex Apart from the New York teacher, the teacher of the week, you could say, there's also a local faculty of, of great players that, that maybe uh, take care of the continuity. So they give you the weekly homework and, and they know the students by name and we support them throughout the whole uh, degree of the bachelor and master programs. Well, that's all really uh, yeah. interesting. It's a great program from what I hear. and. Um, you mentioned that it's only like uh, 2,000 as compared to 2,000 per semester as compared to, <laughs> you know, uh, more than 100,000 for some schools, yeah. and, you know, so. Uh, it's, it's a little more, it's, it's like seven or eight, but it's per year. And then you always, you like almost everybody gets a scholarship. So a lot of people get to pay less than that. So. Uh -huh. But uh, there, there's an app that you can put in your phone, New York comes to groaning and yeah, so you can, <laughs> whoever's interested can check it out. Check it out. Yeah. Okay, so, um, you know, we we asked you about uh, some guys and some great stories. Do you have any other um, fun anecdotes about guys you've played with that you want to share? Oh yeah, I can I can go on and on, but <laughs> <laughs> that's a fun but, stuff. But but I think that important uh, people um, in my career or in my development of music or whatever who I who I met in all those years, uh, one of them is Don Braden, uh, who I worked with for already for maybe twenty five years now, maybe more even than that, and um, like. We got we get along really well, musically, personally too, but musically, because um, like in the early days when we started playing together and and driving around to do, do gigs and stuff like that, we would sit in the car and then I would you know look outside and you know look at the mountains or the nature or whatever, and he would be on his keyboard writing a new tune, and when you arrive at the at the venue. He would like, oh, where's the printer? And like he would print it and we would play it the same night. <laughs> we played the tune. And I was like, man, I wasted all this time just watching nature and he, he just was he's so productive. Tunes. Yeah, he should. So I, I learned from that as far as like work attitude and and uh, yeah, just to to you know, you only live once and there's there's so much I wanna do and that that kind of attitude that I, I that was really an important person for me. Still is. I mean, we are we are now we are still playing together and doing records together and all that stuff. Writing music together. We wrote uh, even for symphony orchestras and we, wow. we, we did all kinds of stuff. So 
Um, and you guys work together here at the, the Litchfield at, camp. Yeah, at the Litchfield camp this week. We are together. Uh, in September, we go to China with, uh, that, that's not for teaching, but that's a, a, a trio gig with Mike Clark on drums. Um, nice. We have a new record coming out also with uh, just very interesting people. Um, so he's an important person for me. And then, uh, well, there's lots of others who, uh, who, 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 that I, who I played with and can tell stories about, but I don't know if you... Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, you know, yeah, um, I guess we'll, we can leave that for future questions and future interviews. <laughs> 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 Do you have um, some things and uh, techniques that you would recommend to young bass players who are getting started as a bassist? Um, well, actually, I'm I'm working on a book about uh, bass uh, bass lines and bass playing. Um, in general, well, there's there's two things. There's the technique as a, as on the bass, but there's also uh, the way I think about uh, the bass is not really um, as the the bass function in the music, but I think I think of it as my voice, like. I can actually, I'm, I'm talking to you now all, the whole time, but I actually feel more comfortable playing than, than talking. Mm -hmm. And, because um, it's like the way to express myself with, with, with the bass is, that's more natural to me. Yeah. Um, but the way I think about the bass is not so, it, it's more like, uh, I, I think a lot about harmony all the time. When I, um, when I compose bass lines, um, I'm not thinking about uh, horizontally bass lines, but I think about the harmony, the chords, the chord changes, and then the chord changes will dictate you how to play uh, lines and also how to play melodies or solos over those harmonies. Mm -hmm. So I'm always thinking about the harmony and not not so much about scales, really about harmony, like har harmonic movements, and. Um, so that's maybe a little different approach than, um, and I, I don't see any books out there talking about that. Like mm. so, that's that's why I'm trying to write it down. But uh, you need time for that. So I've, I didn't find enough time yet to do that. <laughs> I've, I've been too busy. Well, uh, and, and so the bass technique, technically, um, I use my thumb a lot. On, on my left hand, which is right hand for most other bass players, but it's my left hand. So I use two fingers. I don't know if you can see it in the camera, but yeah. But um, but I also use the thumb. So if you want, I can play that for you a little bit for you if you like to hear that. Okay. So um, as far as my left hand and for most people the right hand, uh, I'm using mostly one finger. Sometimes I use both fingers. So depending on where I'm going. But I also use the thumb. So just it's, 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 it's a little more softer sound. Sometimes I use it. Slap. <laughs> use it for that, uh, and I use it for uh, like funky things like. So that's uh, a lot of people try to imitate it, imitate it, and I, I had this from my teacher in Europe who passed away about five years ago, I think. But um, and and all, all of his students used the thumb, but he used it in a different way than I do. Like some of some great players uh, in Europe that 
that really do it differently and maybe even better than me or faster. They play that chair here. So that, that kind of stuff, but I don't use it for that. Mm -hmm. I, I use it really for like effects, but I love to do it. It's, it works really nice as I, I just feel like I have more opportunities um, in, in the palette of sound, you know? Yeah. yeah. And uh, of course I use the uh, like, um, that, 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 that a lot of players do. Breaking. You know, yeah. it's nothing, nothing special about it, or, or like. Techniques are more common that, that a lot of players do. Yeah. Um, also, using the thumb for this. Uh, that's more common, but but this one. The, the funky style is a little different, and and um, and the slap style. say about technique about uh, bass lines um, if I can say something about that too um, if I th if I play for example uh, a bass line or a blues like going on. I, I don't think about the bass lines, but I think about the chord symbols, like, that's like, there's a chord right there, it's not a bass line, and like, when I, when I play like, a, maybe I play two, five, one, or I play like, There's a two five to the yeah. E flat, yeah. like a half step higher. So um, there's all kinds of, and I, I also did like, you know, two five, two five, two mm -hmm. five. Yeah. So I do all that stuff. I'm I'm very conscious about. I'm very uh, aware of my harmonic um, uh, use of of the the bass lines. It's it's really it's all based on harmony. And not on, on I, I feel more, more like connected to piano players or guitar players that mm. way than to bass players per se. You know, that my bass my bass lines are really composed through the harmony. Yeah. So yeah. yeah.
key yours. Uh, well, thank you for playing for for us and playing that renderation of uh, Chelsea Bridge. Um, uh, where can people check you out um, in in the upcoming future and the different projects you're working on? Well, uh, I try to keep it uh, on my website and Facebook so people can check me out there. But um, as far as uh, the, the ne very near future, I'm going to do, uh, like I told you before, I'm going to do this uh, week-long uh, jazz camp in Shanghai, China. Then um, I'm going to be working in Poland with my friend Piotr Wartasik, who's a great uh, uh, trumpet player from there. Uh, oh, actually, next week I'm being at the North Sea Jazz Festival with my own band. Awesome. Uh, with yeah. a great band from New York. Um, playing the music of that record uh, uh, in the spirit of Rashid Ali. And uh, in September I'm going to be uh, touring uh, oh in China again, actually, with Mike Clark and Don Braden. And then um, I'm going to uh, Spain, do some stuff with uh, Mike Mossman. And then later on in the fall I'm doing a tour with Vanessa Rubin in Europe, um, as well as coming back to New York play uh, at Smalls and at, uh, at uh, some other clubs around New York City with various bands. Um, and then, uh, yeah, do, uh, actually I'm going to play with Don Braden's big band too. He has excellent, he's going to start his own big band. Um, so it's a full schedule as far as playing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we have a new record coming out with me and Don, with uh, Jeff Tain Watts and Louis Hayes, two drummers. Excellent. So we you know, keep keep working. Oh, and, and I just finished a tour with uh, Billy Hart and Marco Churnsets. Marco is a wonderful young piano player. So we have kind of a, a new trio going on with that group. It's uh, three generations. I'm the middle generation. So <laughs> the, the older legendary drummer Billy Hart and upcoming young piano player Marco Churnsets. So uh, we just recorded an album with that trio as well. Excellent. Well, uh, cats, so. uh, check out Yoris. Uh, <laughs> really one of the top bass players in jazz, and also look up the Litchfield Jazz Camp and the future projects. Thank you. Thank All you right, for doing man. the interview. Man, thanks a lot, man. We appreciate it.